So welcome, welcome to Pay Attention, interviews about truth in troubling times. And today my guest is Terry Moore. Terry Moore is known as a business philosopher and also as a leader in science and research, seeing intuitively into what is possible and promising in situations involving technology in the future. The founder of the Radius Foundation, a nonprofit forum for exploring insights from different worldviews, and a presenter of two well-known TED Talks, Terry came out of retirement a few years ago to launch a new company called Homeolux. Homeolux produces wellness products that are based on cutting edge science and technology. The products that I'll be talking with him about today are designed to battle cognitive decline and cognitive impairment. And they have a personal meaning to Terry. They're part of his response to his wife's Alzheimer's diagnosis. Terry's also a lifelong spiritual practitioner, and he's my personal friend and colleague. And to put a finer point on it, we went to college together and became friends then. In some ways, our life stories have developed along similar lines, involving not only our spiritual practice practices, but also Alzheimer's disease that deeply touched my own life in that my husband was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's and died from that disease in 2014. And so I witnessed his decline from being a healthy man in his mid fifties to being gradually erased in his functioning until he was infant-like at his death at age 66. And so I'm personally interested in the work that Terry is doing now on gamma light therapy and really happy to be talking with him about that work today. So welcome, Terry. Thank you, Polly. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here and I greatly appreciate your interest in my story and what it is that I'm up to. But, but I, I would like to uh, dilate a little on part of our story. <laughs> um, Polly and I got to know each other because we were both part of an extraordinary undergraduate program uh, where we went to college at Ohio University. Uh, that program introduced us to each other and to a lot of other interesting people. And I also mentioned that program because finally that's the program that, that introduced me to my wife, uh, who was the uh, cause of my interest in uh, cognitive issues and Alzheimer's in particular. Yes, and so even though I didn't know Lynn back then, uh, you know, I know her now and I knew her stories through the Ohio Fellows. And so, yes, that was a wonderful, wonderful experience in undergraduate school and has been really through both of our lives, a kind of thread that has sort of brought a lot of things together and uh, made a lot of things possible. So uh, did you want to say more about that, Terry? Only that it says a lot for the program that it was able to bring people together who have been friends for all of their lives. And that would be you and me and me and Lynn and me and several others, actually. Yes, exactly. Yes. I mean, I, I think that uh, there was something about the ways that we were identified and related to each other as college students that... Uh, actually was, was predictive of something. I don't know what it was predictive of, but it certainly has meant that several of us have had friendships that have gone through our adult lives. So, um, so that's kind of a good segue into talking about how your work with Homeolux got going. And particularly, I'd like to talk with you first about your experience of your wife, Lynn's decline how that came about, how it affected your life and your family's life. Um, millions of people, of course, around the world are affected by neurodegenerative brain disease and their families suffer as well. So I, I wonder if you could tell us your story about, uh, yeah, about yes, that. Yes, but, but let me uh, amplify what you just said. Uh, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in this country. There are 6 million sufferers there are more people will die from Alzheimer's than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. Mm. 
it is a national, it's a, it's, it's a world epidemic. Yes, it is. And, you know, something else that, that I would say about death from Alzheimer's, having seen my husband go through the full arc of early onset Alzheimer's, is that it, uh, you know, in the experience that he had, it, it involved a kind of a, a backwards erasure so that he went back to childhood, toddlerhood, and then infancy. And I know that early onset Alzheimer's is different from others, other kinds of Alzheimer's diseases. But because he completed that whole arc of the disease, he died directly from Alzheimer's. So he, he died from the Alzheimer's in his brainstem. So uh, it's, it's a devastating disease when it goes through the entire brain structure. And uh, I think a lot of people don't recognize what this kind of decline is. You know, they, they think of it more in terms of things that they might have seen in movies or television. But when it's in your family, it's, uh, it creates uh, tremendous uh, challenges, uh, burdens, um, changes, you know, for the whole family. So can you tell us how, how things uh, developed between you and Lynn, how you first understood that there was something wrong and then what happened? Well, uh, I suppose I can start with a, a few things about Lynn. Yes. Um, she was part of this crazy program you and I were part of in college. Uh, and that's because uh, she was so smart. Lynn is probably one of the most brilliant people I have ever met. And I've run in some fairly fast company here and there. Um, truly a genius. Uh, her mark uh, on American industry in several ways are things that we, we deal with, we live with every day. Huh. Uh, just fairly startling legacy. Um, and we were uh, uh, friends and lovers and, and married in uh, 2003 uh, when I came to live in New York. Uh, life was wonderful uh, until about 2016 when things started to get a little strange and then they rapidly got stranger and stranger. Let me add that uh, unlike early Alzheimer's, the pattern Lynn followed is, I am told, typical of people who are very, very smart in mm -hmm. that over time, they, they develop so many coping mechanisms for dealing with their deficits. And they are able to cope until that point when they run out of what's called cognitive capacity. And then it's a sharp decline. And that was Lynn's story. It, it went from um, I'm having a few problems spelling uh, to clearly being uh, disconnected from the world in which we live. Uh, we went through a, a, a phase that uh, her brother-in-law, who's an MD, uh, referred to as the dark days, when we didn't know what was going on, okay. something was happening. Uh, and is also, I think, typical of, of Alzheimer's patients. Lynn was constantly challenging herself, taking an inventory of what she knew, uh, and was really uh, both frightened and angry, although it's hard to tell the difference between the two sometimes, uh -huh. uh, as the disease uh, continued to develop. Uh, and that she was diagnosed actually in 2016 uh, and uh, a year later, she uh, didn't recognize me. Yeah, yeah. So it was a really fast decline, as different from the decline of, of Ed's, Ed's process was much slower. However, that confusion, the anxiety about what's going on with me and the desire to hide it, which I think is in everyone, you know, uh, yes. made the first, let's say, five years of Ed's decline really confusing for me because he was doing and saying things that mm. seemed to be dishonest. I mean, and actually they were 
simply things that were inconsistent because he didn't know what he had said to me previously. And th there's also almost inevitably a kind of, of fear-driven paranoia. Yes, yes. Like, I'm sure you experienced that. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that again, what people may not recognize is that the person who's experiencing this decline you know, is also very confused. Just as Lynn was saying, I have some problems remembering words or you know, doing some math or with Ed, it was like he was having problems with the bank accounts that we had, but he didn't know if those were his typical kind of ADD problems or if he was having some more serious problems. And uh, because he was so young, I don't think it occurred to him at all in the beginning that he could have Alzheimer's. But uh, it's, I, you know, for all families and I think for all individuals who suffer from this, this is a very confusing onset. It's, it's not a disease where you go, you know, you have a symptom, you go, maybe you get a diagnosis or maybe you get a couple of tests and you get a diagnosis. It's, it's usually years of people trying to figure out what's going on. So uh, yes, it, it, it's that point over time when you realize that all of these things that don't make sense suddenly are part of the same phenomenon. Yes, exactly. And maybe a phenomenon that neither the sufferer nor the family member wants to hear. You know, it's like you want to hear. I know in Ed's case, I wanted to hear from the neurologist that he had an endocrine problem because that was one of the things he was tested for, even though it would have been a very difficult endocrine problem, it, it would have been somehow fixable, you know? And so that was um, part of the process we went through. And I think all families go through actually. So by the time you got a diagnosis, what happened then after 2016? Well, <clears throat> let's see, um, uh, do you mean life at home or how, you, how my, my career turned around. Well, I would say first, maybe tell me a little bit about what happened with Lynn once you had the diagnosis, how she say, cognized it or felt about it. And then with you, and then as that developed into your concerns about looking at some research about what was out there. Yes, well, um, as I said, the process took really slightly more than a year that went from question to diagnosis. Uh, and when she was diagnosis, diagnosed, uh, then it was a matter of trying to work out what she would need, what kind of support systems would be helpful. Um, and then finding the people that would provide that and, and creating a schedule and a process that she would not be alone uh, and have the right medications. Uh, and of course, it, this is, I guess this is a point I'd like to make also about uh, the development of the diseases, the needs for medications and amounts of medications evolves with the disease. Right. Um, and it, it's not a matter of finding uh, a particular pill or a dose of something. There's, there's a, um, a tread to the traversed uh, and on one side uh, is agitation and the, on the other side uh, is um, incoherence and sleep. Sleep, right, sleepiness. And, and that, that balance changes over time and so the medications must necessarily change as those do in order to be effective, in order right. to provide the best possible quality of life. So I don't know if you had this experience that I had we, we had a wonderful neurologist at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Hospital. And um, so Ed and I were, were being followed. I mean, when I say Ed and I, I went on every appointment with him because he wouldn't have been able to really go by himself at this point. Um, but, you know, when we would be talking with a neurologist before we had the diagnosis, saying, you know, sh should we get into some controlled studies? You know, should he try this or try that? This neurologist said at the time, which would have been around 2009 when, when I was going through this, um, there's, there's really nothing out there that I would recommend, which was a bit of a shock because I'd been reading things in the New York Times or the New Yorker and my friends were sending me studies about vitamins or brain gym or this or that. And I thought 
you know, wrongly. I thought there's something out there that you can do, you know? And uh, the neurologist now was saying, no, there's really nothing I would recommend for him. And he said, I wouldn't put him in a controlled study because he's, it's going to make him worse essentially. Like it's, it's not something that would suit him right now. And so then once we got the diagnosis, um, the neurologist said, I mean, this was a little, I thought a little strange. He said, well, there's good news and there's bad news. Well, the bad news is here's your brain scan. Most of your cortex is gone. And he put up this brain scan and it was really awful to look at it. And Ed certainly understood what he was looking at, knew it was his picture of his brain. And then the good news is you don't have to come here anymore. You don't have to see me anymore. Why? Because there's nothing I can do. And so we left the hospital that day with this shaking news, which in some ways was a relief. We were both crying. But then on the other hand, there wasn't anything to do. And, uh, you know, we, we went back home. We started thinking about, you know, sort of rock walls that he could build, things that he could do that would occupy him. But the idea that there was going to be some medical help, that was gone. So, uh, you know, I, at that point, would have loved to have known something about a light therapy or anything that would have delayed, you know, some of the ongoing decline. Um, at that point, there was, there was nothing. Uh, eventually, he did take some medications because I made some ventures into the research, called the neurologist and said, would you prescribe this or that? The neurologist wasn't impressed, but he, but he prescribed the drugs. So, um, you know, they, they weren't the kinds of medications that, that Lynn is taking. Um, I think they were, they were called anti-cholergenics or something like that. They, were, they basically had to do with the way that disease might develop, might be, be um, kept from spreading in his brain. But in the end, it might have slowed something. But it, it was obviously and not that was, helpful. And when was that? I, this would have been around 2009, 10. So we got the diagnosis uh, in 2009. And um, he went into care in 2010. Um, and he was then taking something that I, it's hard for me to remember the the drug, the name of the drug, but it was an anticholinergic. That was the drug, but that was the only thing that, and there was a particular well, particular brand of it that I researched. Well, in the decade since then, yeah, there are still no no cures or standard treatments. Nothing. Nothing. No. The last medication that was approved uh, for Alzheimer's, I believe, was approved in two thousand three. Whoa. So that probably is what he was taking. That yes. was, yes. And a hundred percent of the clinical trials have failed. That's right. To date. Right, right, yeah. So I think what, what people need to understand about this, and I know that now the um, diseases that are called Alzheimer's are actually a syndrome. It's like a family of diseases. And, and what Ed suffered from, which is called now early onset Alzheimer's, is actually a genetic issue. It's a familiar genetic kind of disease. But many things that are called Alzheimer's uh, come from lots of different kinds of causes. And we don't know really what's at the root of any of these. Yes, but we used to call them senility. Yes, we Old did. Days. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's true. That's true. They were, they were called senile dementia. And I think right. people did not like the word senile. So they changed it to Alzheimer's dementia, which doesn't include the idea of old age. Um, but I, I think it is remarkable that there's still nothing. And you know what I what I remembered about the theory also, the you know what's the cause of this? Where there were theories about the amyloid plaque, and then there were theories about the hippocampus, and there were theories about genetic mutations or genetic difficulties. And, and let's hear it for tau tangles. 
the tau tangles were in there too. Well, the tau protein was a new new idea, roughly, I think, in that period of time, because I started reading about it because you know, again, when we were seeing our neurologist, I would read about these things and I would go in with my papers and ask him and he would say, ah, ah, that's not going to, ah. and um, he was a little bit interested in the tau proteins and the studies that were going on, I think, in, in Great Britain at the time, I think, maybe Scotland, yeah. I'm not sure. But, uh, but the, the thing that, um, that, that still, when I get into conversations with people about uh, Alzheimer's that still really bothers me is that uh, that other people in the general public think they know something <laughs> about the disease. You know, they think. Isn't that always annoying? <laughs> right, right, right. You know, because they say, oh, it's because you eat too much fat or, oh, it's because you're too sedentary or, oh, you can you can avoid it by reading a lot. I mean, these things are not true. <laughs> that, that, uh, that's right. Uh, and there are so many you know, polyvalent factors that, that yes. combine to produce these causes. And genetics is one of them. But uh, the fact that, uh, for example, your mother had Alzheimer's does not really predict that you will have Alzheimer's. Yes, yes. Unless it's early onset. I uh -huh. mean, again, the neurologist made this clear because Ed's father had Alzheimer's. But the onset that we knew about was at the age of 72. Now it is possible because he was very taciturn. It's possible that there was an earlier onset, but, uh, but it wasn't known about. And so, uh, you know, the neurologist said right away, no, 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 that's irrelevant. If your father was diagnosed at the age of 72, that's, that's not relevant. Um, so, you know, the thing that I think we're going to kind of well, we're kind of, you know, entering into in our conversation is the recognition that there are a lot of symptoms, there's a lot of misery, there's a lot of suffering. There is very little on the side of treatments that have been helpful that actually seem to relieve the symptoms and perhaps even <clears throat> affect the cause, even though we don't know of any single cause. We know that plaque is at least a big symptom. And we know that also that tau proteins are related to symptoms. A deformed hippocampus may either be a cause or a symptom that it's not known. So all of these things are in the mix, but there doesn't seem to be anything out there that can really help. And I think, I don't know how you came upon the light therapy idea. How did that come about? Well, uh, I'll tell you that story in just a moment, but, uh, but let me uh, respond to what you're saying right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is that I have come to believe that there are a number of things one can do to prevent the onset of cognitive decline. Uh, and we can, we can talk about th that later. Uh, or I, I could say a few words now. Uh, there I, enough, say, say it now because okay, this there, is, there, yeah. there, there are many things one can do to be kind to one's brain. Mm. For example, uh, living a heart healthy lifestyle is also a brain healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Staying cogn cognitively involved in activities is important. Getting exercise is important. Getting enough of the right kind of sleep is important. All of these things accrue to better brain health which accrues to better cognitive health. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think there's a world of things that can be done in the prevention side. But at the moment, there's little, if anything, that can be done for, for the, to be an actual treatment right. or cure right. for Alzheimer's. And it, may, and it may be the case that the things that you mentioned may or may not prevent various kinds of Alzheimer's disease, because what Ed had would not have been preventable. You know, it was, it was a disease that was there genetically. It was gonna unfold in a timely fashion. And uh, so I think, again, not knowing what is causing these various kinds of cognitive decline, we don't really know what can prevent right. across the board. So people shouldn't blame themselves you know, for some kind of decline. 
and yet, like any kind of health, it's better to engage in healthy habits than to engage in unhealthy habits, but it might not prevent cognitive decline, even if you do, you know, heart healthy exercise and cognitive engagement. Uh, yes, um, generally things that are good for the brain will be good for one's cognitive health. Right, and good for other things too. So, yes, so, exactly. so once the disease uh, sets on, once any kind of cognitive decline begins, this is where your product comes in. Well, let, let me tell you that story. <clears throat> yes, please. Uh, when we received the uh, devastating news that my wife was an Alzheimer's patient, uh, I really threw myself into the research to see what was available and what was being done. And, and it was just an incredibly bleak landscape. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of time and money and attention being given to the problem of Alzheimer's disease because it's a worldwide epidemic. Uh, but that time and research has yielded virtually nothing in terms of actual clinical uh, treatment. So I, I really threw myself into that world to see you know, what was possible. And then during that time, uh, I, I've always been a, a, a science person. I love, I love science. and. Uh, it's always been part of my life. During that time, uh, I listened to, which I generally make a practice of listening to, the public radio program, Radio Lab. You know, it, it, it's the weekly science magazine. I generally find it interesting. Uh, so one Saturday, by coincidence, not, not that I really believe in coincidences anymore, uh, <laughs> But one Saturday, I tuned in Radio Lab, and they were talking about this research that was being done at MIT. And what they had done there is they had taken a population of white mice that had been bred to have high levels of amyloid plaque in their brains. Uh, and they had exposed them to a light that flashed at one of the natural brain frequencies. There's a natural brain frequency called gamma. I think we, we've generally heard about alpha and theta, but there's also a gamma rhythm of the brain. This natural rhythm that's, that's about 40 beats a second. Uh, and at MIT, they, they had taken this population of mice that had high levels of plaque, and they had exposed them to fairly short periods of, of exposure to this light which flashed at 40 Hertz, the same as the brain frequency. And in a very short period of time, those mice had half as much plaque in their brains. Uh, that's wow. dramatic. Uh, yeah. th th those research data are, are, were published in Nature. So that's, that's real science. And I thought, my, you know, here, it, it's having such this dramatic effect on these, these laboratory subjects. And, and it's a technology that's not harmful and it's not invasive and is not dangerous. Um, so I hired an engineer to build me one for home. And I in, installed it. It came in the form of a number of lights that I could stick around my wife's television. She spent a lot of time watching television. Uh -huh. Uh, and I turned it on and uh, told the house staff that it was a decoration and just leave it on. And I went on a short trip uh, and came back. And as soon as I got back, the senior caregiver said, you know, Lynn seems to be a little bit better than when you left. Uh, uh, and I spoke to her doctor who said, well, you know, these things are cyclical. They're ups and downs, but she's on an uptick now. She's, she's actually better than when you left. And at that point, I told them and I told other people I know in the science and therapeutic and other communities, I know what my experience was and what I had done. And virtually everyone had the same response. And, and almost always in the same words. Oh. And, the, and, and the words were, can you get me one? <laughs> so, um, I figured um, it was my destiny to make this technology available. Uh, and I have, have come to be a really true believer in 40 Hertz light. And in fact, uh, 
you, you may be able to see that it's on my desk right now. As you see it now that you mentioned it. Now that I mentioned it, because it's here all the time. Uh, I have come to think of 40 Hertz light as something like a vitamin. Mm. Uh, the current theory is that, that by, by stimulating the brain with this natural brain frequency light, what happens is the microglial cells that clean up the brain that have somehow gone to sleep or gone offline uh, in one's elder years, uh, wake back up and get back on the job and clean out the brain. Huh. Uh, and I think this is, this is a particularly important phenomenon for a disease that may have um, started to appear 15 or 20 years before someone is symptomatic. Yes, yes, right. Uh, so everything we can do to, to be kind to our brains, uh, such as uh, living the heart healthy lifestyle and, and doing cognitive work uh, and maintaining our interest in things and exposing ourselves to 40 hertz light is, is clearly something we can do. I'm curious about this though. So in the mice, uh, you know, they found in a fairly short period of time that the symptoms were cut in half. And so well, I wonder- the, the, the amount of plaque was cut. The in amount half. of plaque was cut in half. Well, I'm gonna call that a symptom because okay. somebody I know who's done research on Alzheimer's says that the plaque is a symptom more than a cause. So that's, that's his point of view, but he's a, he's a retired uh, physician from Dartmouth uh, Hitchcock. So uh, he, his lab was devoted to treatments for Alzheimer's and cancer. Um, so he, he's, he says that he, he thinks very clearly that the plaque is, is a symptom and not the cause. But whether it's a symptom or a cause, it does actually produce the killing of the neurons eventually. Uh, so I, I wondered in that, first, in that first round of studies, they got good results on white mice. Do you know where this, you know, how the studies have developed over the years? And also the other question is, do they get results like that on humans? Yeah, very good question. And, and, and the, I don't want to speak for them, yeah. uh, but I think uh, the answer is nobody really knows at this point. Uh, not from, from the point of view of laboratory science. Mm -hmm. uh, last I heard, um, of course, they as much as everybody have been in, impacted by the pandemic. Right. But uh, I had heard they were recruiting for level one trials. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, it, in the future, uh, they may have all of the answers. Yeah. But, but there's so many people who are in my position who just don't have time. Yes, exactly. I your mean, position I, I, and your age. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, eventually, uh, it may be a uh, curable disease, mm -hmm. but I have the problem right now. So the question mm -hmm. is, what can I do right now? Here's, here's something that's hopeful mm -hmm. uh, that one actually can do right now. So in your own life and with Lynn, before we, I want to go into a little bit more about the gamma light itself and, and also about light therapies because people are into infrared light therapy, they're into other kinds of lights. But um, do you see, what do you see with Lynn? What have you seen in your own experience? I mean, I don't know if you have seen any changes in your own cognitive functioning uh, that you can track or you can say, you know, subjectively, it seems to me like this, this has happened to me. Do you, uh, what do you think? Um, well, subjectively, um... I'm not at this juncture concerned about my cognitive health. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's probably a good symptom. Uh, <laughs> and, and I'm doing everything I can to be good to my brain, particularly exposing it to 40 Hertz light, which you can, can, can see right now, right. If, you, if you look at it. Um, am and I how, and how, how, well, how often, let's let me, I'm gonna go to a side question. How much of the day do you spend, do you spend exposed to 40 Hertz or, can you estimate it? Oh, I, I have it on all the time. Uh, I figure it's something you can't overdo uh, and that it's always good for your brain. Uh, the question really is for those who, who have a cognitive issue or are facing Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. how much time should they spend with 40 years life? And we say at least an hour a day and one oh. doesn't have to look directly at the light. 
simply the fact that that it's available in one's peripheral vision or part of one's ambient light. It's it's the 40 hertz that's important. Does it work when you're sleeping? I don't think so. I can't answer that for sure, but, but I, I, I believe it actually need, needs to go through the uh, optical circuitry. Uh, and uh, does uh, the light affect anybody's sleep cycle? Well, it, it, it's, it's interesting you should mention that because the, the most frequent comment we, we hear from our users, from our customers who, who write feedback or reviews is, well, I, you know, I, I'm not sure this is really doing anything, but I noticed that I'm sleeping better these days. Hmm. And my and my mood seems to be better, and, and I, I I seem to be a, a little more attentive. So maybe maybe it is working. Hmm. Uh, hmm. Interesting. The, the well, uh, comment on sleep is 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 probably the most frequent comment we hear from our users. Well, that's interesting too, because if it is the case that these microglias, is that right, microglias? Yes. Yes. Um, are actually enhanced. And they are kind of like part of the immune system for the brain, maybe, you know, they clean up uh, the garbage, right? Um, like our immune system does otherwise, then I would imagine that if the garbage interferes with sleeping, <laughs> then sure. sleeping would improve. Sure. And uh, I, I know that from, from talking to Dr. Paul Ero from McGill University, mm -hmm. a part of the concern that a lot of people have with wireless technology is that the radiation, the uh, you know, electromagnetic radiation from the technology affects sleep cycles. And so who knows, but you know, there, if this improves sleep, it's just sort of interesting to think that there might be something to offset certain kinds of effects on the brain that might be going on as a result of some of our technologies. Well, we, we know that sleep is important, that various parts of sleep are particularly important. Yes. Uh, I'm not quite sure how 40 hertz affects a particular phase of sleep. Mm -hmm. but, but again, the, the, the thing we uh, have most often heard from our users is I'm sleeping better. That's interesting. And you? Are you sleeping better? So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping better. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, well, oh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, yes. So, with Lynn, then let's go back to her and her symptoms and what you know about people that have already been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and the gamma light therapy. How, you know, how does that? seem to be going, and I, I recognize that you're saying that clinical studies aren't complete and we're not trying to be scientists. We're actually just sort of trying to talk about what seems promising, right? Right, well, uh, since we're talking about anecdotal evidence here, uh, one of my favorite uh, well, episodes was when Lynn's doctor visited her here. Uh, this particular visit was about a year and a half ago. Uh, and uh, I, I have gotten to know him over the years. And I said to him, when I asked the question, how long did you think Lynn had to live? You said, you thought about two years. That's three and a half years ago. What, uh, he, and he said, yes, she's been remarkably stable. Oh. And I said, yes, remarkably stable. I credit the gamma lights. He said, I cannot disagree. Huh. And, and then he asked me for a business card. <laughs> uh, um, but yes, that's, uh, huh. that's one of my favorites. And, and, and we, we do get, get reviews uh, from customers who say things like, you know, dad used my name for the first time in, in a year. Huh. Uh, huh. One of Lynn's caregivers some time ago said that, uh, in 25 years of, of working in this industry that he had never seen as much language recovery uh, as she wow. had experienced. Wow. That, 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 was, that, was, that was his statement. Now, uh, Lynn still is largely, if, if not completely incoherent, but she does speak. Mm -hmm. And sometimes she speaks 
full syntactical sentences. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, that's all uh, I can say. So expressive speech also, you mm -hmm. know, may or may not um, interact with cognition. Yes. Um, so people can have aphasia, they can have difficulties with expressive speech and still actually know clearly what's going on. Um, the last time I saw Lynn, I would say, you know, she didn't recognize me. She never knew me well anyway, but she did focus on me. I mean, she, she didn't ignore my presence in front of her face. Um, so I, I don't know if you've seen any changes on that cognitive side that might not be expressive. Um, it, it's completely unpredictable. Uh -huh. uh, some, some days um, she, she does not know I'm in the room. Uh -huh. Some days uh, she clearly lights up when I appear. Yeah. But, but let, let me also add uh, that clearly the high point of Lynn's week is music therapy. Yeah. <laughs> it was Ed's too, I have to it say. Was, yes. 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 When she's obviously uh, you know, energized yeah. and, and happy. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's, of course, is thrilling to see. Yes, it is. And, and you've probably read Your Brain on Music or mm. Oliver Sacks' book on yeah. musicophilia. That uh, those were things that were out, you know, when Ed was, was in care. And uh, so I, I actually hired somebody to play music and to sing at the care center. And then also a music therapist to come in and work with a group of Great. people. Uh, and the, the thing that was so remarkable about that is that through, the, through Ed's decline, when he, when he really wasn't speaking much, he could still sing and he could sing in French. I mean, he could, he could sing in, you know, he could remember lyrics and oh, sing. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, it's, I think it's also uh, sort of typical, you know, and who knows why? I mean, there is something about music. In fact, I learned from the music therapist that if she would sing to people, you know, what is your name? They would sing their name, but if she asked them, what is your name? They wouldn't know it. <laughs> so, you know, who knows what that is, but uh, it's, uh, it, sounds, it sounds like light and music. <laughs> You know, might be. Uh, I, I must. Be. I must give that a try. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's interesting. I. Yeah. I. I. Um, Th I this, this is why. Why, groups of caregivers are so important. Yes, that's right. Because you actually find out lots of things by just chatting. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about gamma light therapy, and then light therapies in general, and then why you decided on the particular products that you decided about. Um, and, uh, and then I do want to talk with you also about well people using the light, you know, using your light. So uh, because of course you, the things you told me about brain health didn't really have to do with gamma light therapy. They had to do with, with other things. Um, so, but let's start with light therapy in general, gamma light therapy. I don't know if you know much about the infrared light or if you have interest in lights. Uh, yes, I, I, I'm interested in light in any, any number of directions. Um, I don't know much about other light therapies. I know that uh, uh, there is um, infrared therapy, there, there's shortwave infrared and longwave infrared therapy. Those apparently are, are different things. Um, and um, sure, I mean, light's important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, light is important. It is important. And it's, it's really seems to be sort of all around us all the time. But uh, so the, the way that the gamma light affects the brain is by attuning with a natural cycle. Well, yes, the, the, there's this natural brain frequency called yeah. gamma, yeah. which is 40 cycles a second, 40, 40 hertz. Uh, and, and that frequency... Uh, is correlated with attention and memory uh, and recall. Hmm. Uh, so uh, if, if you can persuade the brain to work at that frequency, uh, you will presumably get 
uh, better attention, better recall, uh, better cognition. Uh, that's what that's the, it's what the brain wants to do anyway, one might say. And if it didn't have all that plaque or all those tangles clogging up the synapses, it would be doing that. So what, if, what about, let's just, I'm just going to ask you a few questions that come to my mind. Using this kind of light with children in classrooms and so on, because we have these problems that are called ADD, you know, attention deficit disorder, uh, or, you know, the, um, that sort of hyperactivity attention disorder, there are a lot of uh, concerns, you know, among educators about this growing difficulty with attention. And now, of course, people are on their Zoom classrooms, which I'm sure is much more difficult for children to pay attention. Right, uh, and, and, and we live in a world where, where all of the, the things that we use are trying to get our attention and are using yeah. our time and sometimes very sophisticated means just to get our attention. Right, and it's coming through light also. Right. I mean, right. just like exactly. I'm looking at you through light. I mean, I'm not, you're not in the room. I, the light would allow me to see you anyway in the room. But now there are all sorts of lights coming right at me. Um, so I w wonder about, I mean, do you know anything about whether gamma light is, is, is also effective <clears throat> for healthy brains, for kids, for people who don't have? Well, uh, well um, uh, no, uh, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, if, it, if it is helpful in, in maintaining a clean brain and knowing that Alzheimer's disease begins 20 years prior to it being symptomatic, one would think that anything you can do to clean up the brain as early as possible would be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, not to mention the fact that 40 Hertz is correlated with, with um, memory and attention. So when you say correlated, do you mean that the brain shows this pattern? Yes. Or do you mean that when in the presence of 40 Hertz light, the brain coordinates with the light? Or do you, is there? I, I, I think both are true. Both are true? I, I think when, when a, a healthy brain has a gamma rhythm, mm -hmm. of, and that's part of healthy memory, cognition, and attention uh, to the degree that we can promote the brain having its own gamma rhythm by stimulating it with a gamma rhythm mm -hmm. like our product uh, that would logically accrue to all of, the, all of these better things. But, but yes, um, one does wonder about the, the effects on children and young people uh, of light and modulated light. Um, you, 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 you certainly are familiar with PIE, uh, photo-induced epilepsy. No, um, I don't think so. Uh, epileptic seizures can be triggered by flashing lights. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That, I, I actually know that only because I, uh, I, I see a couple of people who've had brain injuries and they can't use the, I mean, I see, I talked to someone it, this morning on Zoom and who couldn't use the, uh, the it, video. It, it, it's a well-known phenomenon and it's the reason there, there's a warning on every video game. Mm -hmm. Let's see if somebody else picks up the phone here. Sorry, yes. Uh, that's why there's a warning on every video game uh, hmm. that, that one should be careful of these things. This is also the reason why you have never seen series of series or year one episode thirty eight of Pokemon. Well, tell me more. I, I haven't seen Pokemon at all, but tell me what. <laughs> well, that's that's because in episode thirty eight of the first season, uh, at some point when good confronted evil, uh, it did so against a flashing background of blue and red, and it flashed at 14 hertz. And before the program was over, many children had been admitted to emergency rooms. Wow, wow, you, no, you, I don't know. I did not know about that. That's very well, interesting. Uh, yes, but, but that's down in, in the, the a, a lower frequency. Yeah. That happens at four, 
15 hertz and, and this phenomena of photo-induced epilepsy is generally associated with frequencies below 20 hertz and we're up at 40. Uh, nevertheless, it's, uh, it's something to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it seems like there's, there's some kind of logic in all of this that uh, would say something like this, that, that uh, light frequency really affects brains. <laughs> You know, um, yes, and, uh, and, and how could it not? Yes, of course, of course. But most of us don't think about that specifically when we think about brains. You know, I mean, we, we, we might think about fish oil, but we don't think about light. <laughs> so, you know, um, I so we, I we, we don't, but, we, but we've come to think more about it. Look at, at uh, seasonal affective disorder, which is now that's true. clearly, yeah. clearly clinical diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and people here in Vermont sit around with lights, <laughs> you know, in the in the period of time we're in of, right now. Of course, right. and, and, and this is real science and medicine, and it's light. Mm -hmm. it's light. Mm -hmm. So back to what you did and why you made what you made and why you were making what you're making. Um, and so it's this one frequency of light, and you initially made it in a decorative way so that it looked like well, it was... That, that, that's part of our design philosophy. Uh, it has to be in a form that people will use. Mm -hmm. um, it has to be uh, user friendly. The controls have to be ergonomic. Uh, it can't, it, it, it must be uh, at least acceptable in, in almost every decor so that it doesn't look like a piece of medical equipment sitting out. Uh, Everything we can do to make it user friendly, we do. One of the big advantages uh, of our approach is that it doesn't require being attached to the um, the patient. Uh, there are some oh. light devices that require wearing goggles or a helmet oh. or sending a probe up one's nose. Uh, and I, it, as you know, doing those kinds of things with an Alzheimer's patient is very difficult, if not impossible. It's usually impossible, yes. Yeah. Um, so, so we have a product that, that, that is not invasive, mm -hmm. uh, that's good looking and user friendly. And that's part, that was part of, and, and uh, uh, well-priced. I mean, it's not, it's not an expensive device. It's $250. Oh. Uh, I, I must say it sounded almost like a, an ideal date <laughs> no, it's user friendly, not expensive, not invasive and attractive. I do not know. It's... <laughs> well, yes, indeed. Uh... <laughs> maybe, maybe eventually you'll put it inside of a robot and uh, <laughs> the person could, thought. they could date your gamma light There's robot. <laughs> so, um, so right now, what, what, what are you, uh, what do you, I assume, you know, your company is called Homeolux, people can find it online. Um, and what, what kinds of products do you have and what are you developing? And then I wanna ask you a little bit about the other kind of uh, light that you're interested in after that. <laughs> All yeah. right. Uh, yeah. Well, our, products is, our product is what we call the Beacon 40, which is the device that provides 40 Hertz light. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a, a new new version on the drawing board that will be uh, sound controlled. It can it can be voice operated, and will also provide a connection with other realms of interest and treatment that may be helpful, such as uh, daily exercise routines, uh, r recipes, uh, things that that are are brain healthy and fit into one's life uh, that one can access through a portal. And we, we, we are going to be that portal. The portal will be a kind of Siri type. I mean, is it sort of a voice well, activated interactive smart device that's gonna tell you how to live? <laughs> <laughs> There's something about that question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or that's going, that's going to be a good date. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it, it will be a, a database. Uh, and it, <laughs> it, it is accessible through Siri or through Google. Mm -hmm. or, uh, 
and through uh, uh, Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would also provide other resources and information that would be be useful in a brain healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, th those are the, th th those would be two different products, the Beacon 40 and this other sort of. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's the Beacon 40 2.0 version. Oh, Beacon it really, 40. It will really, really be the, the same device, but, but it will also provide access to 40 Hertz sound. So 40 Hertz sound, tell me about that. Uh, 40 Hertz sound seems to have a similar impact on the brain. Uh, it's, a, it's a little harder to produce in any kind of assimilable way, uh, okay. but it can be produced uh, and incorporated into, uh, for example, your favorite music. And that's one of the things that we're working with right now. We, we launched a camp at Burning Man this year where people could take their own favorite recorded music uh, and include with it a 40 hertz audio signal oh. so that not only could would you, would you be able to enjoy listening to your favorite concert of any kind but in the process you would be exposing yourself to 40 hertz sound and, and does that is that inaudible for most people i mean do, do no, does... no it's it's audible in fact i would say it needs to be audible much, much as the 40 hertz light needs to be visible visible so but it's it's the so the 40 hertz light looking at you is subtle and i i must say i did not pay attention to it until you drew my attention to it now now i can you know as soon as I, as soon as you drew my attention to it of course then i saw it constantly uh with the sound would it be similar that, or is it audible enough that you have to no. blend it with your music no the sound is audible enough that you need to blend it with your music uh but but the reason we, we want to do this as part of our product is because we want to make sure that the 40 Hertz light signal and the 40 Hertz sound signal are perfectly synchronized mm -hmm. because if, if they're not synchronized, then, you know, <laughs> it's noise. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, so, so that they need to be synchronized. And I think when they are providing the combination of 40 Hertz light and 40 Hertz sound together, um, will be even better. It's gotta be good. Well, uh, is, there, is there research on the sound? Yes, there is research on the sound too. And where has that been done or how, what is it, do you know? Um, uh, if you, I, I, I can't quote you the mm -hmm. specific citing or institution, but if, if you visit our website at homeolux.com, we have many references to research there. Okay, okay, so it's on, it's on your site. So on your website. Um, I, I think that uh, this is all sort of fascinating because it's, there's no question that sound and light are very much a part of our everyday lives and affect us all the time. And I know that one of the, uh, you know, one of the big discoveries that, that, uh, that I made in some of the uh, meditation that I did with sound which I've done quite a lot of, um, and particularly Shinzen Young's approach, is that when one has equanimity with sound, which means that you don't push and pull on the sound, uh, then you, you really don't have this distinction between noise and sound or noise and music. And, you know, John Cage was, I think, trying yes. to experiment with some of that. So uh, it's just interesting to think that, uh, you know, we're always being influenced by light and sound, but, uh, you know, there might be a way to be influenced in a really healthier way by it. Uh, yes, that, that's right. And um, it, as, as you just said, uh, it's part of our life, sound and light. And mm -hmm. uh, as you also just said, if we can keep from bringing our own baggage to the experience, mm -hmm. It's really there for us. Yeah, yeah, and it affects us in ways that perhaps we are going to be coming to understand more as uh, a medicine, you know? I mean, I'm sure that in traditional cultures, there's a lot about light and sound oh, affecting sure. people, <laughs> yes. Of course there is. Of yes, course yes, there is. yes. What, what, we, what we didn't know is that it wasn't just cultural, that it actually had a biodynamic uh, effect 
Yes, yes, yes. And now that we, we in the West who are great believers in science, we mm -hmm. like to we like to have our particular stamp that's, yes, that's belief right. that's right. on on things that might have been known to be really effective for a very long time, but they didn't have our stamp of approval on them. So that, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, look at, mm. yes, it kind of looking at the uh, image behind you. Uh, that's partly what brought that to mind is that uh, there have been many cultures that have had really important influences on the brain that probably combined light and sound. <laughs> uh, yes, we, we, I, I just mentioned tr traditional music, which uh, yes. we, we think of as cultural, but may actually have had a, a brain healthy component to it. Yeah, yeah. You can say the same about architecture. Yeah, like yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, there, yeah. Now we're talking about light. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So now I'm going to just change the channel a little bit and uh, talk to you a little bit about viruses and light. Mm. And if you, if you don't mind, because this, I, too I, I, I don't mind at all, but it's, uh, <clears throat> we're going to be changing texts here. We're changing, we're changing yeah. channels from, we're going to change the channel here now from cognitive decline and dementia and healthy brains, which we've covered so thoroughly that there's nothing more to say about that. <laughs> Unless you have well, something more to say. Do you have more to say about that uh, before? No, but I'd be happy to talk about uh, this other phenomenon, which I'm truly interested in and excited about. Uh, yeah, me and, too. I'll, and I'll tell you about it in probably too much detail. Where, where shall we start? So I want to start with the fact that, uh, you know, we're, we're in this period of time now. Oh my gosh, we've been in it for too long already, uh, where we're, we're, we're afraid of a virus that is invisible and a virus, this particular virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, I guess, is the virus and the disease is COVID-19. A lot of people don't seem to know that there's the difference between the virus and the disease. But in any case, this particular disease and virus are preoccupying us and, and sort of have shut down our, our culture, our relationships, and uh, lots of things. Uh, and the, the thing about any virus, uh, which is similar to any cancer and a whole lot of other things that we get all jazzed up about, we can't see them, you know? And so we don't know if they're there or not until we've been affected by them. And because of that, with the COVID-19 disease, people have had to stay away from a lot of environments that they should be in for their business, for their schools, for their religions, and so on. And uh, because they're afraid of infection in those environments. Right. This is all part of the equation. What does it mean to keep people safe? Yes. How, how safe do you want them? Uh, and whatever your answer is, it's going to have some concomitant in education uh, and in mental health yes. uh, and in the economy. Yes, exactly. And, you know, the other thing that I think was happening before this virus came on board was something that the um, psychologist John Haidt calls safetyism, that even before the COVID-19 came around, we had the idea in colleges of safe spaces, of needing to be safe from various kinds of in, intrusive ideas or language and so on. So there was already a kind of hyper valuing of safety as though safety somehow might be more important than a whole bunch of other things that we'd previously thought were very important. Um, and so, I think right now, the, there's something there that people are beginning to look at the sort of risk benefit analysis of safety, like how much do we want to reduce risk or how does risk interact with the benefits of being with others, of being able to do things in a cultural space, of being able to be you know, able to be with, uh, to allow, allow our children to play together. I mean, it's just, it's trillions of things. It's not just a few things. So I know from talking to you early on, when we started talking about this, uh, the COVID-19 disease, that you know about a light that is a sterilization light 
that is the kind of light that doesn't harm people, even though it does probably kill viruses or it definitely kills viruses. I don't know for sure. But uh, so I wanna hear about that light and hear about what you are doing and developing or thinking about or interacting with people who are developing that technology. Fine, I, I would love to talk to you about it. Uh, this also is a story that starts with my wife. Hmm. Because about six years ago, she went to the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia and said, I, I want to eliminate the problem of hospital-borne infection. Hmm. Uh, and she said, you know, I'm thinking there's a device. Um, I think it looks like a porcupine. Uh, but when somebody leaves the hospital room, you pull this thing in and turn it on and come back in 10 minutes and the room will be sterile. Wow. Uh, now, if you could do that, you could yeah. save more lives than penicillin. Yeah, right. I know. I know. So uh, Columbia thought, yes, that they, they, they would uh, accept that as a research project. And that went on for a couple of years. And then it ended up at the Center for Radiological Research, uh, which is run by a very brilliant uh, biophysicist by the name of David Brenner. Uh, and although it has been known for a hundred years that you can kill bacteria and viruses with ultraviolet light, yes. the problem is ultraviolet light is dangerous. It yes. causes cataracts, it causes skin cancer, uh, and that's why even though it is in many ways a standard sterilization technology, when it's in use, people can't be anywhere near it. Right. Uh, and that's, that's the way it's used today. So, but, but what Dr. Brenner found <laughs> is that way down in the far C part of the UV spectrum oh. at 222 nanometers, there was a wavelength of ultraviolet light that would not cause skin cancer and that would not cause cataracts, but that was deadly on virus and bacteria. Huh. He later discovered that, that it would kill aerosolized bacteria and virus. Later discovered it would kill COVID and recently that it would kill COVID-19. So here we have 222 nanometer light, um, which, which clearly will make the space between us all safe. Yeah. No more masks, no more worrying about the person that sneezed right. in the back row. Uh, so in order to make 222 nanometer light, uh, the only way to do it was to, to create a light bulb and fill it with rare gases and put in some electrodes and charge it to a certain value. And then it would give off 222 nanometer light mostly, but you have to wrap a filter around it to make sure that you're getting oh. just the safe light. Uh, and that, and uh, there's one company in Japan and I think one company in the US who are working with this technology. But the problem is that process is not inexpensive and it's not scalable. Yeah. And what we need is a way to produce 222 nanometer light that, that is inexpensive and scalable uh, because we don't need 10,000 of these. We need 10 million of these things. Right, right. Um, so what, what it really needs is, is something like a solid state device, something like an LED uh, mm -hmm. that would produce that wavelength. Unfortunately, the physics says you, say you can't do that. <laughs> so, so tell me what at that, that when you say nanometer, uh, so is there something in nature that produces that kind of light or is it entirely manipulated light? Uh, well, well, we don't get much UV light really because of our atmosphere. Right. Uh, other than B, uh, which gives us suntans and skin cancer. Uh, but so the UV light that's in our atmosphere is not at that no. rate or speed. So no. this is, what, what is the, why is it so hard to produce it? Why does it, I mean, well, I understand about the filter because you have to filter yeah, out what right, might be harmful right. of it, but to, why is it so yeah. hard to produce it? Well, nobody has yet figured out why. Uh, I mean, people will say, well, 
You can create it in an LED, but you can't get that wavelength out of the LED. Uh, uh, so, so let me put it this way. Uh, here we have a, a technological solution to a major world problem. Right. When someone solves that problem, it will divide history into yeah. before and after. Yeah. Uh, everything will be different. It's, it's like uh, uh, the germ theory or clean water. Uh, it will have that effect on the culture everywhere. Uh, but, it, but it has to be scalable and it ha you have to be able to produce it in enough quantities. Uh -huh. uh, if it was a matter of taking the best physicists and the best optical physicists in the world and putting them together in a lab and giving them unlimited resources and unlimited time to solve that problem, we would already have a solution because Phillips or Siemens or General Electric would have solved this problem. Nobody has. Uh -huh. Nobody has the idea about how to make this happen. So what, what I'm doing is I'm creating a contest oh. uh, with a cash prize and all sorts of routes to, to funding. Uh, and I'm making it available to everyone because I believe it requires such an out of the box answer that you can't look to physics and optics for the okay. solution. But mm -hmm. somebody's gonna look at the problem and say, well, well, you know, the octopus does it this way. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, and, and that's where the, where the solution will come from. But eventually there will be a solution. And when it does, it will save tens of millions of lives. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I mean, it's very easy to picture what the solution would look like, that right. these devices would be everywhere, okay. everywhere, everywhere in environments where, you know, people are inside spreading viruses. The and space between us will be safe. Yeah, yeah, and so uh, well, let's say it's it's safe within reason. Because sure, <laughs> we are, we no are ab no absolutes here. Yeah. Well, we as human beings, we're we're not safe with each other. Unfortunately, we have difficulties relating. So we would be safe within reason, within the human <laughs> reason. But. So, so what is your prize and how do people find out about it if people are listening? And we have probably a lot of young people listening all over the world. People are listening from Asia. And uh, well, uh, I, I, I'm doing this prize through uh, one of my organizations called Sequence Ventures. Uh, and if you go to sequenceventures.com, uh, we'll have a description of the prize. And if anybody can't get there, they can get a hold of me any time they're interested. Mm -hmm. uh, in pursuing this problem at any level, at, in, in any way. Do you think it's more of a physics problem or an engineering problem? Well, your, own, your own thoughts about it, you know. Uh, my guess is it's an engineering problem, but that, that, that's a guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, uh, because the ideas seem pretty easy to arrive at, but the actual technology. That's right. You can make 222 nanometer light getting it on a target at enough strength uh -huh. is, is an, I think it's an engineering problem. But as I said, it, it, I expect the answer to come from somewhere way out of field. And now are there universities working on it though? It seems that there would be, I mean, in this atmosphere with what everything that's going on, you'd think it would be something that would be pushed ahead of all sorts of things. Well, we, we've talked to a couple of universities who are interested in the problem and, uh, uh, we're encouraging them, uh, but I, I don't know that there are any universities who have actually taken this as a challenge hmm. because it, it's a difficult it's a difficult challenge. So it it seems as though the um, gap is pretty large right well, now uh, between the idea and the reality. Is that the reason? Do you think? Uh, yes. Uh, here we have one of the most important ideas ever, and, mm -hmm. it, and it's failing at the level of idea. Mm -hmm. It's failing at the level of mm -hmm. figuring out how to do this. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it's a little bit analogous to the issues surrounding Alzheimer's because we've been, you know, trying to solve the problem of 
finding the cause, finding the treatment for a long time. And there are things we understand about what the disease is, but the gap between that and uh, actually treating it <laughs> is pretty large. Yes, uh, and uh, another area where uh, one needs better ideas, more and better yeah, ideas. Yeah. yeah. Or, I mean, or, th there or, is a lot of promising research being done in Alzheimer's. Yeah, well, there, you know, the thing I, again, from hearing from my friend uh, from Dartmouth who, who spent his career on cancer and Alzheimer's prevention, he said that, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the research money was kind of going in the wrong direction. It, it was mm -hmm. looking, it was looking at plaque reduction rather than looking at the cause of the disease. And well, said, the Alzheimer's world is, is very much divided about these things. And there are people who feel very strongly about oh, talk yeah. angles. Yes, I know. Um, there are people who, who, who uh, what, what we, we, we do know that uh, plaque is correlated with the disease. It is definitely no. correlated. We know, we know a lot of things that are correlated about a lot of diseases. And um, I mean, his, his theory, which is also sort of worth sort of stating, um, I, I think on, on one hand, he'd be very favorable about prevention, you know, because he was interested in prevention and the light may be one of the most important ways to go. But also he and a group of other people wonder if there might be something in the structure of the brain that is actually inadequate or deformed, like something in the hippocampus. And uh, you know, over a period of time in life, the brain compensates, the, the cortex, the other, the other structures, and particularly the structures that interact directly with the cortex. So, so, so is that hippocampal problem a design flaw? Uh, it, 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 it seem in the, again, in the theory, yes, it is. And then that produces eventually in the aging process, essentially uh, the decline of the cortex, you know? And then when the cortex begins to decline, you get the tau proteins, you get the, the amyloid plaque, and it's sort of like a wildfire that starts and then burns through the, the cortex. But the, but, the, but the idea there is that there's a, there's a structural problem that the um, organism can bear you know, for a period of time, it bears that pretty well, but then at some point it can no longer bear it. And that, that's like some other diseases as well, you know, where there's a sort of a design factor, there's a flaw and the organism bears it for a period of time and then it starts to fail and then you get symptoms and the symptoms then can look like the cause. You, you see what I mean? Sure. Um, so, um, but, I think that, you know, getting back to the, um, tell, tell us what you call this light. I mean, I, I know you've told me what uh, Lynn called it, uh, that, that kills the viruses. Yes. Uh, uh, it, it is best known as far UVC. Far U? Far, far ultraviolet light. And it's, it's, it's in the C part of the spectrum. So it's, okay. it's UVC. Yes. And it's in the far part of the spectrum, so it's called far UVC. Yes. Uh, and that's that's the best we can do for the moment is yes. being descriptive. Yes, we could have a pet name for it, but that's probably not very helpful. Well, that does sound like a porcupine, far UVC. I mean, it sounds like it has spikes, spikes. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, far out, I guess. It's far away. Far out, uh, yes. This is far out. And that, and that too, yes. Yes, yes. So, um, so let's let's move on a little bit and just a, a few things about light. I was I wanted to ask you, you know, whether you think there is a sort of metaphysics of light. Uh, certainly, a lot of people do. I don't know how you. By a metaphysics here, I I simply mean that something that. Um, you know, sort of, uh, how do I want to say it? Stands at a higher level of reasoning than physics. You know, it's com it's more comprehensive of a bigger picture because as we said earlier, you know, many religions, many traditions, I mean, we're just in Hanukkah, you know, um, they focus on light. Right. Um, there's the Christian star in the sky. I mean, they're just a lot. <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, all the traditions I know of clearly regard light as being more than a physical phenomenon. Yes. 
uh, and uh, I think it fairly clearly is, uh, it's because um, it's everywhere and isn't it amazing? And, and we, we have references to it in our language. We talk about people being enlightened. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so forth. Yes. Uh, so yes, I mean, it, it's everywhere and um, is and the, positive. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Well, in the, in the solar system, because the sun is so central you know, and, and seems to be the body of light that has been the focus of much life on earth. Using you know. another light word there, focus. <laughs> The <laughs> focus, right? You know, it, it seems like there is this idea that light is life giving or that light is the very nature of consciousness. And uh, I don't, I don't know if that has had any effect on your work or if you Well, I, I'm, in, I'm interested in all these things, I must say, I, I don't know what to do with the phrase like light is the nature of consciousness light and consciousness certainly have uh, similar characteristics. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, because the light allows us to discern something. Now, right. you know, we can discern in the dark, but uh, we're, you know, as humans, we're very tied to our visual uh, senses. And so the light helps tremendously with that. So. I don't know if there's anything more to say about that or to say, you know, I think when I was putting together the interview, it just, it, it just sort of struck me that you've had a lot of interest in light. And oh, I, I have, and uh, it's um, metaphysical correlates, as you say, are clear. All the traditions talk about light. It's clear what light means to us uh, as beings. Yeah, yeah. We, we live in light and... Um, and the speed of light has been the ultimate speed that we have kind of known about or imagined and take it as the foundation. Yes, for that's right. It, it, it's, it's, it's the standard for this space and time. For the space time that we're in. Yeah. Yes, yes. Right. Even if we get beyond it, it will always be the standard for space time, right? Right. Here, yeah. here. So um, I, I guess in the, you know, the, the last part of our conversation where what I'd like to turn to, because I think that um, Alzheimer's and cognitive impairment in, in families, uh, you know, they, they affect people spiritually. People, uh, many people would say that, uh, that if they were to get a diagnosis themselves or in their family, and I, and I see a number of people in therapy who have had a, a spouse or a, a parent uh, diagnosed with um, Alzheimer's, uh, that, uh, that this is a tremendous disaster. I mean, people take it on the surface to be a disaster and nothing that, um, nothing that could be promising, you know, nothing that could lead to anything good, let's say. Um, and it, but in my own life, uh, going through the process of watching Ed's decline, I, um, I learned so much about love. I learned so much about consciousness. I learned about what and, I would call and, was- and, and let me quick in, interject yeah. here that you Thanks. wrote a wonderful book on this topic. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, The Present Heart is a memoir about this. Wonderful book. Thank you. Um, and ultimately, I, if I, you know, if I stand way back from the 10,000 foot view or whatever, I would say that I learned more from Alzheimer's than I have learned from anything in my life, you know, because so many things, it, it threw so much into question. And I had to, I had to learn then. What was that question? Why did it throw things into question? What had I been counting on? Um, and so I wonder, you know, if you've had any kind of similar effect, or how you look at, or how you understand your wife's disease, and you know, from the ten thousand foot view, uh, as a challenge or as a spiritual development or anything for you? Well, uh, you know, it, that, that's a deep and emotionally heavy question. 
Um, but I, I would say it, it hasn't um, diminished any part of my belief uh, that consciousness is part of the world in which we live. And I mean that in a, in a grand scheme, not, a, not in a space-time sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, you know, things happen to it here and there, but finally, finally it, it's the one consciousness. Yeah, yeah. So it transcends the brain. Yes, indeed. Of, of course, of, of course, it transcends the brain. Okay. Well, not everybody would say, "Of course, it transcends." <laughs> no, no, no. I, I understand it, and uh, that's why I was uh, making yeah. making fun of them. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. So, so there's something about about your experience with Lynn. Has that affected any of your? You know, it certainly affected this interest in light. I mean, you came to. Well, I, I mean, it, 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 it affirms the uh, belief, the observation that life is full of experiences. Some are positive, some are negative. They all come and go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, the thing that doesn't come and go uh, is consciousness. Is awareness, yes. Is exactly. awareness, exactly. That's right. That's right. It, it, it's, it's there before these phenomena arise and it would be there if they didn't arise. That's right, right. So, so I suppose that maybe the most important part of that was the way you answered the question about the brain. <laughs> so. Well, can you remind me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that you're, you're very clear that consciousness does not rely on the brain. Oh, no. Right. And so, as we move through issues involving the brain and treatments for the brain and uh, and decline of the brain we we those of us who embrace a different view that do mm -hmm. not think that the brain generates consciousness right you know, we we need to be clear that it's not as though that individual is losing consciousness that's right right so you are you are oh so right it's not something to be lost right so that's probably a really good place to end oh okay now that we've shed light on all of these topics <laughs> yes indeed <laughs> so um i i think we've we've covered everything about your new business and about your inspiration to uh work on this very special kind of light that could kill viruses. Uh, is there anything else you want to add about any of this before we say goodbye today? Um, no, other than I want to say again, 40 hertz light is good for everybody. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, we need an idea about 222 nanometer light. Beautiful. Okay, thank you so much, Terry. Thank you for everything oh, you do. Thank you for your time and your interest. Yeah, it's been great to see you again. Let's hang sometime. Yeah, it's been lovely. Yeah, we have to do this more often, right? <laughs> Deal. Count me in. Okay, thanks, Terry. Bye-bye. Bye for now.